Hello everyone. Uh, we will be covering the 2015 CHEP recommendations and focusing on what's new and what's still really important. My name is Raj Padwal. I'm a general internist at the University of Alberta and I'm here with my colleague Dr. Doreen Rabi from the University of Calgary. I will be going through the first half of the slide deck and then I will hand it over to Doreen to complete the rest of the presentation. Uh, before I begin, I would like to give you a little bit of background on Hypertension Canada. Hypertension Canada is an entity that was formed uh, as a conglomerate of different organizations uh, a few years ago. And the combined mission of this organization is to advance health through the prevention and control of high blood pressure and its complications. Our vision is that Canadians will have the healthiest blood pressure in the world. I should mention and take time to thank all of the frontline practitioners out there. Because of you, Canada has actually the world's highest reported national blood pressure control rates. And the Canadian Hypertension Education Program has received a lot of visibility and kudos for uh, the work that it's done, uh, primarily through you out there on the front line to improve blood pressure control. Uh, we've done it through annually updated guidelines, uh, a well-validated review process, uh, dissemination and implementation of these guidelines across Canada. At this point, I personally would just like to pause and on behalf of Doreen and myself, we would like to thank the Recommendations Task Force, which is pictured here. These individuals meet every year. Uh, they are volunteers, and they freely give their time to improving blood pressure control uh, and management in this great country. It's a pleasure and an honor to be part of the Recommendations Task Force and to work with these individuals uh, on an annual basis. I would also like to give you a little bit of background on the organizational chart for Hypertension Canada. Uh, the Recommendations Task Force is primarily comprised of a central review committee and different subgroups. We perform annually updated uh, reviews of the literature and we have a fantastic uh, Cochrane Collaboration Librarian who does this for us. Uh, the subgroups then review this material and decide if new recommendations need to be made. They work with the Central Review Committee, who is free of any industry conflict, to decide if recommendations should be put forth, as well as to decide on the wording and the background of the recommendations. The draft recommendations are then presented at the annual consensus conference and voted upon, first in person and then electronically, by the entire recommendations task force. Those recommendations that pass are then written into our annual manuscript which is published in the Canadian Journal, uh, Journal of Cardiology and I'd like to thank Dr. Natel from Canadian Journal of Cardiology for putting up with us and publishing it every year. And then we have entire processes devoted to dissemination uh, and implementation. Uh, I'd also like to just briefly take you through the entire process. So I've described the implementation task force and the work that it does. Once the manuscript is published, we then work with the dissemination task force to uh, implement uh, the recommendations, creating tools, uh, performing train the trainers, uh, working with our excellent stakeholders, which include NGOs as well as uh, primary care and allied health care uh, provider organizations. Um, we also have an entire branch called the Outcomes Task Force, and this branch is dedicated to uh, examining epidemiological aspects of hypertension in Canada, prescribing trends, as well as examining and uh, uh, deciding upon the most important knowledge gaps that need to be addressed in future work. I would also finally like to take this opportunity to thank the CEO and staff of Hypertension Canada who we work with on a uh, very close basis and who are instrumental in making all of this possible. 
This slide summarizes what is new in Canada for 2015. We have four new major recommendations. Number one is the recommendation to assess clinic blood pressures using electronic or otherwise known as oscillometric monitors. Number two, our recommendation is that the diagnosis of hypertension should be based on out-of-office measurement. Number three, the management of hypertension is about global risk management. This is a recommendation that we've had previously. Uh, this year, we have some new recommendations and a new focus on smoking cessation. And we give guidance to practitioners around advice and pharmacotherapy for smoking cessation. And number four, we have a new recommendation and new advice regarding the treatment of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. And specifically, that medical therapy is primarily indicated for these individuals rather than interventional stenting. Uh, we'll also review some of the factors and some of the recommendations that we think are still important. Uh, most important out of this would be lifestyle modification or health behavior modification. It's still integral to the management of hypertension and in many instances can preclude the uh, institution of drug therapy. We also advise, and it's impossible to manage hypertension without knowing the proper blood pressure thresholds and target values required in different age groups and different uh, patient populations. And thirdly, adherence is a major problem. We know that adherence over the long term to high blood pressure medications as well as other medications used for cardiovascular disease prevention is suboptimal. And we have some tips to give you regarding uh, improving adherence in your patients. Uh, this chart depicts the usual blood pressure values uh, that represent thresholds for the initiation of drug therapy. Uh, the Canadian Hypertension Education Program recommends that in patients with type 2 diabetes, or all diabetes for that matter, that drug therapy be instituted if the blood pressure is above 130 and above 80. For high-risk individuals, that is, those with target organ damage or cardiovascular risk factors, we recommend initiation thresholds of 140 over 90. If a patient is low risk, that is, no target organ damage or risk factors, we recommend 160 over 100. And I should mention that these individuals specifically, although all individuals should receive health behavior modification, these individuals stand to benefit the most from health behavior modification in the sense that it may lead to a lack of requirement for uh, further drug therapy. And finally, in the very elderly, we recommending initiating drug therapy at a threshold of 160 millimeters of mercury uh, based on the, the, the limited trial evidence that is available in this population. This slide depicts the recommended treatment targets. Just a reminder that when CHEP refers to treatment, we are referring to both health behavior modification and pharmacological management, and we stress that every patient with hypertension or even at risk for hypertension should try to optimize their health behaviors. The treatment targets are a blood pressure less than 130 over 80 in diabetes, uh, less than 150 in the very elderly, and in all other patients, less than 140 over 90. I would also like to draw your attention to the footnote at the bottom of this slide. In patients with coronary disease, if the diastolic blood pressure is lower than 60, we do recommend caution when lowering systolic blood pressure further. So these would be instances in which the individual has isolated systolic hypertension. The reason we recommend caution is that it may precipitate angina or worsening of the coronary disease symptoms. It does not mean to avoid lowering blood pressure in these individuals, just that one should be cautious and look carefully for symptoms and signs of coronary ischemia as required. Another factor that's still important is healthy behaviors and health behavior modification. 
This chart summarizes the impact of different health behavior modification uh, on high blood pressure. You can see here that one derives a fairly clinically important reduction in blood pressure when these health behaviors are optimized. There are six major health behaviors here and they all act to reduce blood pressure. This is a summary of health behavior man management for patients with high blood pressure. Regarding sodium restriction, we recommend that individuals reduce their sodium intake towards two grams per day. Regarding optimal BMI, it is less than 25 kilograms per meter squared. Alcohol restriction, physical activity, the DASH diet, a smoke-free environment, and maintaining optimal waist circumference at the targets shown on the slide are also recommended. Another very important issue in the management of high blood pressure is achieving patient buy-in regarding antihypertensive drug prescription adherence. We know adherence is a major problem because hypertension is typically an asymptomatic disease and it is often difficult to get patients to adhere optimally to their medications. What are some of the ways in which we can help patients adhere in an optimal manner? A multi-pronged approach is generally recommended to improve adherence. It is unlikely that any one factor will cause optimal adherence or lead to optimal adherence, and this is why a combination of factors is required. These include the following regular monitoring, especially home monitoring of blood pressure, educating patients, using an interdisciplinary care approach, and this may involve nurses or pharmacists or other allied health professionals encouraging adherence through frequent telephone contact or visits. In addition, we recommend ad assessing adherence at every visit and teaching patients to take their pills on a regular schedule. Simplifying medication regimens are, is also an important way to improve adherence, and we recommend doing this by using long-acting, once-daily preparations, single-pill combinations, and unit-of-use packaging such as blister packaging. And now we come to the new recommendations for 2015. The first new recommendation is to monitor blood pressure in the clinic using electronic or oscillometric devices. And by extension, what we are really saying is we're recommending against the use of auscultation for the assessment and diagnosis of hypertension. More on that in a minute. The second recommendation is to use out-of-office measurement to rule the diagnosis in. And again, these out-of-office devices are all oscillometric devices, so this is really also an extension of the first new recommendation. The third recommendation is that the manage should management of hypertension should focus on global risk assessment. Part of global risk assessment and management that is very important is smoking cessation. In 2015, the CHEP RTF has made recommendations regarding the use of advice and pharmacotherapy for smoking cessation. And finally, the treatment of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis should primarily be medical. And this is a recommendation against routine use of stenting in this patient population. Before I get into the specifics of the first two recommendations, I would like to present to you the new diagnostic algorithm that the Recommendations Task Force has drawn up. This replaces the older and probably to most people more cumbersome algorithm that was in use for the past several years. We've tried as much as possible to streamline the algorithm. It starts off with an elevated blood pressure reading, whether this is in the office, at home, or in a pharmacy setting. We recommend that these individuals with an, with an elevated reading, and I should stress this is a screening reading, 
should then have a dedicated visit in the office where they undergo history, physical, and diagnostic testing. If at this initial visit, the blood pressure is severely elevated, greater than 180 over 110 is the cutoff we've chosen. And I should stress this is not based on one measurement, but rather several measurements in that one clinic visit. Uh, then the patient can be diagnosed confidently with high blood pressure because it is, because it is unlikely that the blood pressure will normalize uh, and the patient won't require treatment. If the blood pressure is not this high, but it is elevated, greater than 135 over 85 using an automated office device, or greater than 140 over 90 uh, using uh, what we call office blood pressure measurement, and I will detail the difference between those two in subsequent slides, then the patient is potentially hypertensive, and they really do require a definitive test to rule it in. Now, in past years, we have recommended the far right of the slide, which is serial office measurements over several visits and an average taken across all of these visits in order to rule in the presence of hypertension. And you can read the cutoffs that are required for each visit in order to make the diagnosis of hypertension. However, uh, this is a very cumbersome way of diagnosing hypertension, and we believe that it's not very often followed. For this and for other reasons that I will outline in the subsequent slides, we recommend immediately performing out-of-office measurement. This can be ambulatory measurement, which is preferred, or it can be serial home measurement. Regardless, the out-of-office measurement is used to rule in the diagnosis of hypertension. And if it is present, then the physician or practitioner will manage the high blood pressure. If it is absent, then by virtue of the fact that the initial screening readings were high but the definitive test was normal, the patient has white coat hypertension and they should be followed up annually. They do have a much higher risk of developing overt hypertension over time I should stress that individuals with white coat hypertension should not routinely at this time be treated with drug therapy, but health behavior modification would be a very important uh, therapy to install and discuss with these patients in order to prevent their further progression to overt hypertension. Now let me double back after giving you that overview and talk about the different blood pressure measurement methods. In the office, blood pressure can be measured using auscultatory or oscillometric techniques. This is known as office blood pressure measurement. More on this in the next slide. There is also another way to do it in the office, and this is called automated office blood pressure measurement, or AOBP. In this manner of measuring blood pressure, the patient is alone in a room and an automated device is used to measure the blood pressure several, several times and that device then averages the blood pressure for the practitioner. In some ways it is easier to measure blood pressure in this manner because the process is automated. However, these devices are more expensive than using a standard device uh, that is electronic or oscillometric in nature and sitting with the patient pushing the start button to measure blood pressure. We also have ambulatory monitoring, which I believe is probably familiar to most practitioners. This is a device that measures blood pressure over the entire 24-hour period. And finally, home blood pressure measurement is using the same type of automated or oscillometric electronic device uh, that is used for OBPM but in the home environment and the patient is responsible for following a protocol and getting the required readings, reporting it in a format that the practitioner can then use to make management decisions. Office blood pressure measurement. Here we have two pictures. One is depicting auscultatory measurement. This is the tried and true method we've used for over a century. 
It's a method that is accurate in theory if performed in standardized fashion. The problem is that it is almost never performed in a standardized fashion in the real clinic environment. And therefore, after several years of deliberation, the RTF has finally decided to recommend against routine use of auscultatory measurements in the clinic. Instead, we would direct you to performing oscillometric measurement. And we will discuss some of the advantages of oscillometric measurement in a subsequent slide. Just a reminder that if you go to the web link at the bottom of the slide, you will be able to look up which devices are validated for use in the clinic or home environment. This slide depicts automated office devices. Again, these devices are oscillometric in nature, but what they do is allow the practitioner to leave the room and conduct other business, uh, which is very important in a busy clinic environment. Meanwhile, these devices are taking blood pressure in a serial nature, usually three to five times, spaced approximately one minute apart, and averaging it so that the practitioner has a single summary measure that they can then use to, uh, to inform management decisions. Again, they're at the Dabble website, there are there is a list of validated automated office devices. Here is the recommendation that is new for 2015 concerning office blood pressure measurement. We are telling individual practitioners to use electronic or oscillometric devices rather than auscultation. The problem with auscultation is that practitioners tend to A, deflate the cuff in a rapid fashion, thus missing important Karotkov sounds. B, there is a tendency to something called terminal digit preference where individual practitioners will round off the readings rather than reporting them as accurately as possible. And C, and very importantly, mercury sphygmomanometers are now being phased out and really are not available across the country in any clinic except those that have had special permission for their use. In these clinics, if you wish to use auscultatory measurement, you have to use an aneroid device. And the aneroid devices, when initially used and brand new, have been factory calibrated and are accurate, but they tend to lose this accuracy over time and need to be frequently calibrated, which we know is not done. Uh, for these reasons, we feel that auscultatory measurement is not accurate, and the evidence base, a huge evidence base in fact, bears this out. And for these reasons, we are recommending oscillometric measurement rather than auscultatory. Let me review a few keys to accurate office blood pressure measurement. Again, now we are talking about using an electronic or oscillometric device. It is important to use still standardized measurement techniques and validated equipment. For standardized measurement technique reviews, go to our website or to our main recommendations manuscript in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, which is published every year. For validated equipment, go to the Dabble website using the web link that you saw on previous and on subsequent slides. Remember, we always recommend multiple readings. So the first reading is discarded and the latter two averaged if the typical three readings are performed per clinic visit. More readings is always better, but we recognize the time constraints in uh, real world practice and three is a good uh, compromise between expending the amount of time for proper measurement and getting a reasonable average. So, when one has an elevated screening visit and has booked a dedicated hypertension visit, uh, we now see that unless the blood pressure is severely elevated, one has to rule in the diagnosis of hypertension. So those other modalities that I was previously discussing, office measurement, uh, automated office measurement, these are for the initial assessment of blood pressure. 
But now to make a formal diagnosis, we do need to perform out-of-office measurement, and that's a key uh, new recommendation for 2015. The preferred method is ambulatory monitoring, which is shown on the next slide. So ambulatory monitoring is advantageous because it is the best prognostic indicator of future cardiovascular events when one looks at studies comparing ambulatory to home measurement and to conventional office measurement. Ambulatory is also very important because it gives you many readings over the span of a 24-hour period and it gives you nighttime readings and the nighttime readings are actually the most predictive of future cardiovascular events. Again, one can go to the DABLE website, uh, which is shown using that hyperlink below these pictures, and get information on which ambulatory monitors are validated. An alternative to ambulatory is a series of whole measurement. I won't detail the exact way to do the series, but it is on our website and in the recommendations manuscript. Essentially, it involves seven days of readings, four readings a day, first day is discarded, and the latter six days are average, so you are averaging 24 readings. Uh, whole measurement is almost as good as ambulatory measurement. Uh, it is more convenient for patients and in some cases more accessible to patients if an ambulatory monitoring program is not available. Just to summarize some of the rationale for using out-of-office BP measurement over in-office. The bottom line is that out-of-office measurement consistently has better predictive ability than in-office. And this is true for ambulatory monitoring as well as home monitoring. The other very, very important advantage of out-of-office measurement is that it identifies white coat hypertension. Identifying white coat hypertension is of critical importance because these individuals do not need to be treated. It is estimated that up to 30% of individuals diagnosed with hypertension in fact have white coat hypertension and should not actually be, be being treated with medications. It is our hope that this will more appropriately target those individuals that need pharmacotherapy while avoiding it in individuals that do not. Here are some data depicting the advantage of out-of-office measurement over office measurement. And you can see here that for each of these endpoints, LVH and albumin excretion ratio, and for bo both systolic and diastolic blood pressure, Ambulatory monitoring was most highly correlated, uh, home was second, and office was a fairly distant third. And there are a wealth of data like this in the literature underscoring the uh, prognostic advantages of out-of-office measurement. Uh, this slide depicts the different uh, modalities or entities that can occur in terms of diagnosing hypertension or normal tension. In individuals who have a blood pressure that's elevated both in the office and the ambulatory setting, these individuals are hypertensive no matter how you've measured them. In individuals who have elevated readings in the office setting but normal readings in the out-of-office setting, these individuals are called white coat uh, hypertension they do not need to be treated, but it is very important to pick them up. Uh, individuals who have normal office readings but elevated out-of-office readings have an entity known as masked hypertension. More on that in a minute. And individuals who are normal both ways are normal tensive. Masked hypertension is important because it is equivalent in prognosis in the limited number of studies that have been done to uncontrolled hypertension. At this point in time, we do recommend that masked hypertensive patients be treated because of this prognostic data. In addition, white coat hypertension, as previously mentioned, has a prognosis that is similar to those individuals who are normotensive, and that's why we do not recommend treatment of white coat hypertension at this time. Uh, I should make a note that Mast hypertension is not really the focus of this slide set. Uh, in our new algorithm, individuals come to attention because they have an elevated reading, 
and most of the time that elevated reading is going to be in the office setting, masked hypertensive individuals will have normal readings in the office setting and elevated readings in the out-of-office setting. There is no systematic way to identify these individuals at present, uh, but we do mention it in this slide deck for completeness sake. Now, who is at risk for white coat hypertension? Well, you can see in this slide that there are a number of varied and diverse groups that are at risk. And so the bottom line is it's very common. Because it's very common, we are now recommending that out-of-office measurement be performed for all individuals suspected of having high blood pressure based on elevated office readings. And this is really part of the rationale for why out-of-office measurement needs to be done in order to confirm the diagnosis in everyone. This slide gives you a summary of the risk factors for masked hypertension. This is just for completeness sake. In future iterations of the guidelines, we plan to dedicate more focus towards masked hypertension. It is an important entity to detect because of its prognosis. However, we have not yet arrived at a, a decision in terms of what the optimal way to search and detect it is. Just to summarize then, uh, what we have uh, initiated and added to the recommendations for 2015 is that out-of-office measurement is critical to identify white coat hypertension and to rule in the diagnosis of high blood pressure. And this is because A, out-of-office measurement, specifically ambulatory and home, uh, can recognize white coat hypertension and also because it has better prognostic predictive ability compared to office measurement. And this is for the endpoints that I showed you in the last slide, LVH and albumin excretion, but also for harder cardiovascular endpoints and even mortality. And back to the new algorithm. So uh, the algorithm has been streamlined and the major highlight of the algorithm is Number one, when an elevated reading is discovered, to dedicate a visit to perform a history, physical, and lab testing as outlined in our recommendations document. Uh, number two, if the blood pressure is severely high, they have hypertension, just remember to take multiple readings. Never make a diagnosis based on one reading alone. Uh, number three, if the blood pressure remains elevated at that office visit, do out-of-office measurement and preferably ambulatory monitoring if available to rule the diagnosis in. And then finally, number four, if the patient has white coat hypertension, uh, they should be followed up annually, but they don't require therapy. And I guess the last issue is we have retained the older diagram with serial office visits we recognize that in some cases, ambulatory monitoring may not be available and home monitoring, for whatever reason, may not be feasible. One can still make the diagnosis using serial office measurement, but as you can see, it is a very cumbersome process to do this. Just a reminder, if you are going to do it, the averages shown in the slide are the averages across all of the visits and not just the average at a single visit. Now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Doreen Rabi, and she will take you through the rest of the slides. Thank you. My name is Dr. Doreen Rabi, and I'm now going to walk you through the CHEP 2015 recommendations for vascular protection and new recommendations regarding the treatment for atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Once again, in our 2015 recommendations, CHEP continues to reinforce that the management of hypertension is all about global cardiovascular risk management and vascular protection, including advice and treatment for smoking cessation. As we know, hypertension is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, and 8 out of 10 hypertensive patients have at least one additional risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, and we must remember that with an increasing number of risk factors, we see an increase in global cardiovascular risk for these individual patients. The importance of uh, cardiovascular risk profiling patients with hypertension was highlighted in the checkup trial. There's a great deal of evidence to support that simply documenting um, and quantifying a patient's uh, cardiovascular risk is a very important uh, strategy in terms of reducing a patient's uh, risk for cardiovascular events. Um, 
what I'm presenting here is data from a randomized controlled trial that examined the value of using cardiovascular risk profiles as a treatment strategy for patients with dyslipidemia. And the data I'm presenting here is from a sub-analysis of the hypertensive patients that were enrolled into that trial. And what the investigators showed is that using cardiovascular risk profiles relative to uh, usual care um, were associated with um, improved blood pressure. Uh, so patients that had hypertension and were involved in this trial and received cardiovascular risk counseling saw significantly lower blood pressures at the conclusion of the trial and also saw more um, appropriate use of antihypertensive therapies through the duration of this trial. Beyond documenting uh, other cardiovascular risk factors in patients with hypertension, um, it's important to uh, determine the appropriateness of treating these other uh, cardiovascular risk factors. CHEP continues to recommend that statins be used in high-risk hypertensive patients, um, and we categorize patients as being high-risk if they have established cardiovascular or atherosclerotic disease, or at least three of the following risk factors in addition to hypertension. And these risk factors include male sex, being 55 years or older, being an active smoker, having type 2 diabetes, having a total cholesterol to HDL ratio of 6 or higher, having a family history of premature coronary vascular disease, having a previous stroke or TIA, the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy, ECG abnormalities, microalbuminuria or proteinuria, or the presence of peripheral vascular disease. Another uh, vascular protective strategy um, that uh, um, CHEP recommends is the use of low-dose aspirin. Um, in particular, we recommend that low-dose aspirin be used in patients who are hypertensive and over the age of 50 years. Uh, we also note that um, caution should be exercised in patients who have high blood pressure but is not yet well controlled. And this is to reduce the risk of uh, hemorrhagic strokes that can occur in patients that are on uh, antiplatelet therapy while having uh, uncontrolled hypertension. And now I'd like to introduce um, new recommendations for 2015 in the area of vascular protection. Our first new recommendation in this area is that tobacco use status of all patients should be updated on a regular basis, and healthcare providers should clearly advise patients to quit smoking. This recommendation is based on a large uh, evidence base that supports that physician advice regarding uh, smoking cessation is highly effective in their smoking patients. Um, and presented here is data from a Cochrane systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control trials that looked at the efficacy of physician advice relative to usual care uh, on um, sustained smoking cessation in their patients. Um, the uh, outcome in these trials were sustained smoking cessation at six months. Um, and the intervention um, uh, included uh, uh, healthcare providers providing advice to patients on smoking cessation um, in a short 20 minute session um, and one follow up uh, session. Um, and this minimal advice intervention um, was associated with a 66% odds of uh, s sustained smoking cessation at six months. Um, interestingly, more intensive interventions that involved uh, written materials or referral to community-based smoking cessation programs was only minimally more effective than this very minimal office-based intervention. Uh, our second uh, new recommendation in the area of vascular protection is that advice in combination with pharmacotherapy, including varinicline, bupropion, nicotine replacement therapy, should be offered to all smokers with the goal of smoking cessation. Um, and similar to our uh, last recommendation, this new REC is based on a very large uh, evidence base that supports the use of pharmacotherapy for the goal of smoking cessation. Um, and uh, what I'm going to review here is data from a Cochrane network meta-analysis, which is a review of systematic reviews on this topic. Um, and Kate Cahill and colleagues uh, synthesized data uh, from meta-analyses that looked at the efficacy of nicotine replacement therapy, um, bupropion, and nicotine receptor partial agonist uh, therapy, um, in particular varinicline, uh, on sustained smoking cessation. Um, and they included uh, systematic reviews that studied um, the efficacy of these agents in achieving sustained abstinence from smoking. Um, and so they had to have a period of abstinence that was six months or longer. 
And again, they synthesized um, 12 Cochrane systematic reviews in this network meta-analysis. Um, so they incorporated data from over 267 studies, uh, uh, including a data on over uh, 10,000 um, uh, participants. Uh, what I have displayed here is a forest plot from this network meta-analysis. Um, and uh, what we have here are the pooled estimates of effect for nicotine replacement therapy, um, bupropion and uh, varinicline versus various comparators uh, that were evaluated in these uh, meta-analyses. And I'll draw your attention to the top of this forest plot, uh, which shows that the odds of um, remaining smoke-free at six months were significantly higher for uh, nicotine replacement therapy, bupropion, and varinicline, uh, with varinicline um, having a, an odds ratio of almost three, um, uh, showing that uh, the odds of uh, remaining smoke-free were, were, were far, far, far greater with the use of pharmacotherapy than uh, with placebo. So now I'd like to discuss the new recommendations for therapy. Um, and this year, um, the uh, Recommendations Task Force approved new guidelines regarding the treatment of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis with a focus on primary medical therapy. So our new recommendation uh, for um, 2015 is that patients with hypertension attributable to atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis should be primarily medically managed because renal angioplasty and stenting uh, offer no benefits over optimal medical therapy alone. And this recommendation is based on several studies, uh, but the most recent of which is the CORAL study, uh, which randomized 947 patients with hypertension um, uh, that was uh, managed with two or more uh, medications and documented renal artery stenosis. Um, patients also could uh, uh, qualify for the trial on the basis of having chronic kidney disease uh, secondary to renal artery stenosis. Um, these patients were then randomized to receive either uh, angioplasty with a stent um, in combination with um, medical therapy or medical therapy alone. Um, and the medical therapy uh, uh, intervention included um, antiplatelet therapy, uh, antihypertensive therapy so that um, patients achieved a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90 um, if, they had, uh, if they did not have diabetes and a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 with diabetes. Um, and this medical therapy was uh, based... Um, uh, was, uh, was comprised of candesartan, hydrochlorothiazide, uh, uh, and amlodipine. Um, and they also received lipid-lowering therapy with atorvastatin and optimal glucose management if they had diabetes. The primary outcome of this trial uh, was a composite of cardiovascular and renal death, uh, stroke, myocardial infarction, uh, heart failure requiring hospitalization or progressive renal insufficiency, or the requirement of permanent renal replacement therapy. And after five years of follow-up, as you'll see on the uh, right side of the slide, um, the uh, time-to-event analysis showed that uh, whether patients received revascularization or medical therapy alone, their time-to-events were almost identical. Um, and uh, in the end, the conclusion was that renal artery stenting did not confer a significant benefit with respect to the prevention of clinical events when added to comprehensive multifactorial medical therapy in patients with atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis and hypertension or chronic kidney disease. And again, this is one of many studies that have, uh, sh have shown this. Um, and uh, our new recommendation is also based on data from a meta-analysis, which included uh, the results from the CORAL trial. Um, and uh, in this meta-analysis, they, they examined the efficacy of revascularization strategies relative to medical strategies um, and found that there was no statistical difference between um, the uh, uh, outcomes of mortality, hospitalization for uh, uh, congestive heart failure, stroke, or worsening renal function. A second uh, new recommendation that we've added to uh, uh, the therapy section with, with respect to uh, the management of renal artery stenosis is that renal, and, renal artery angioplasty and stenting for atherosclerotic hemodynamically significant renal artery stenosis could be considered for patients with uncontrolled hypertension resistant to maximally tolerated pharmacotherapy, progressive renal function loss, and acute pulmonary edema. And the Recommendations Task Force felt that it was important to add this second uh, recommendation because not all patients um, uh, with renal artery stenosis um, uh, were evaluated in the context of the CORAL trials or, or the other trials uh, that informed our first uh, new recommendation in this area. And in this table, we have the uh, patient characteristics according uh, are, are listed by trial. Um, and as you will see that... Uh, 
uh, the inclusion criteria um, included uh, uh, renal artery stenosis that um, uh, were more anatomical than clinically significant. Um, and patients with higher grade stenoses uh, were not uh, uh, included in these trials, and therefore the results of these trials um, uh, may not be applicable to, to those patient populations. Further, if we look at the um, uh, number of antihypertensive agents that were used um, in patients that were enrolled in these trials, um, it varies from two to three agents. Um, and the uh, enrolling blood pressures, uh, uh, while elevated, um, uh, were, were moderately elevated. And it is quite possible that these patients weren't truly resistant, but were just undermanaged when enrolled into the trial. So again, for patients with high degree stenosis with resistant hypertension, uh, it's quite possible that they may respond differently to revascularization interventions um, than the patients studied in these trials. Um, and uh, until more evidence is available um, uh, evaluating uh, uh, revascularization strategies in these more complicated patients. Um, CHEP thinks that it is fair to at least consider uh, revascularization in these, uh, in these more complicated resistant patients. So the CHEP 2015 recommendations have uh, brought in a number of new recommendations. And just to quickly summarize these again, uh, that assessing clinic blood pressures should be uh, done using electronic or oscillometric monitors. The diagnosis of hypertension should be based on out-of-office measures. The management of hypertension is all about global cardiovascular risk management and vascular protection, including advice and treatment for smoking cessation. And the treatment of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis is primarily medical. And what's still important, um, we must know the blood pressure thresholds and treat to target. Uh, we need to encourage the adoption of healthy behaviors, um, and this is integral to the management of hypertension. And the most important step in the prescription of antihypertensive therapy is achieving patient buy-in. So again, uh, CHEP continues to, to reinforce the importance of therapeutic alliances with our patients. And to conclude, I just wanted to remind everybody that there's a wealth of resources available for patients and healthcare providers at hypertension.ca. We, we encourage and, and welcome you to access these resources uh, as much as possible. And I'd like to thank you for listening to this presentation. 